Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Gen 2, your source for all things gaming and tech related. I'm Aaron James. And I'm Quinn Foose. Let's get right into this week's up and coming releases. You can see these games and many more released throughout the month on your favorite platforms. An incredibly quiet week for game releases this week. So we have a couple of new games for the PC, nothing more to note, and the return of Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Murder by Numbers releases for the Switch on March 5th. In this game, you must solve pixel puzzles to find clues. Use the clues to interrogate witnesses, work your way to find the truth, and uncover the mystery of murder by numbers. Fourth Generation Warfare releases for the PC on March 5th. Fourth Generation Warfare simulates warfare in the 21st century, which, in addition to the direct opposition of military forces, now includes espionage, international politics, cyber warfare, media manipulation, and trade wars. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX releases for the Switch on March 6th. Wake up in a world of Pokemon only to discover that you yourself have become a Pokemon in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX. Solve the mystery of your strange predicament by befriending other Pokemon and traveling through dungeons that change every time you play. These games and many more will be releasing throughout the month, so be sure to be on the lookout for them. Up next is Wireside with Quinn. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Wireside with me, your host, Quinn Foos. Video games cost money. It's a harsh reality, I know. If you're lucky, you can get other people to spend that money for you. I doubt you're that lucky. I know I'm not. I'm willing to bet that anyone watching this show right now, whether you spend your own money on video games or not, can relate to my past self regarding where that money went. Unless you are sorely deprived of the pleasure, you know that the best place to buy your video games is none other than GameStop. Or at least, it used to be. Through a series of developments in the gaming industry and some arguably poor business decisions, GameStop has seen a fall from grace in recent years. But why is that? Well, let's chat. GameStop, for anyone who does not know, is an American video game and gaming merchandise retailer. The company was founded in 1984 and has now been operating for 36 years and has over 5,000 store locations globally. It is widely agreed that GameStop's most successful years span from 2004 to 2016. My own introduction to gaming came about around 2010, so for the majority of my time crushing noobs, GameStop has been my go-to source for the next 20 to 60 hours of my free time. GameStop remained successful for such a long period of time due to its acquisition of other companies such as EB Games in 2005, Spawn Labs and Impulse in 2011, and Buy Mytronics in 2012, as well as others. Its ability to absorb competitors and smaller businesses gave the company a leg up on competition and allowed it to accrue increasing profits as time moved forward. However, this was not enough in the end to carry the company through the digital age. As online services like Xbox Live, the PlayStation Network, and Steam grew, consumers began to move in the direction of purchasing downloadable digital copies of their games. The convenience of this ability is just too much to resist. Most games now can be pre-downloaded, usually 24 hours prior to the release, and are ready for gamers to start up as soon as the official release time comes around, without having to go anywhere to pick up the game, and without having to insert a disc that you will have to keep track of and maintain. This development led to falls in the company's stock over the years. Paired with multiple management changes, these factors resulted in a need to initiate comeback efforts. While a lot of time and energy has been put into bringing the company back from the brink, those strategies do not seem to be producing positive results. In late 2019, GameStop announced that it has plans to close 180 to 200 locations in the short term and potentially more over the next two years. I will always hold good memories of GameStop and its prime in my heart, but unfortunately, we may soon have to say goodbye. Till our next chat, I've been Quinn Foose. Thanks for watching! Who amongst you is with me? And who is betraying me? How's it going everybody? Welcome back to The Biggest and Baddest, where we take a closer look at some of the most iconic video game villains of all time. This week we're looking at the smooth-talking Dutch Vanderlyn, but most people call him Archibald Smith, or Hoagie McIntosh, or Featherstone Chambers, or Aiden O'Malley, but most frequently just Dutch, those are his aliases. 
Dutch is one of the main antagonists in the first Red Dead Redemption installment and a central support character in Red Dead Redemption 2. Just a warning, there are spoilers to the Red Dead series in this video, so don't say I didn't warn you. Dutch van der Linde was born in 1855 to an unnamed father and an English woman named Greta. Dutch never talks about his childhood, and most of his early years are a mystery. His father fought for the Union in the Civil War, but died in battle, most likely in the Battle of Gettysburg. This seems to be the cause of Dutch's animosity towards Southerners. Dutch is a man that values freedom and liberties above all else. In the story of Red Dead Redemption 2, his main goal for the Vanderlyn gang was to run away from the law by raising enough money to move west to live an independent life. And to do that, we still need money! In Dutch's early years of crime, he was in a quote, odd partnership with Colm Driscoll, a leader of another gang in the area. But that partnership ended when Colm killed Dutch's lover and Dutch killed Colm's brother. Dutch sees himself as some sort of Robin Hood figure, where he justifies his crimes of killing and stealing from innocent people by saying he's fighting against the corruption of the federal government. Dutch Van Dillen may not be a good man at heart, but at times he's very supportive and caring towards his fellow gang members. For example, both John Marston and Arthur Morgan were taught to read by Dutch. He refers to them as his sons or children. He also saved a recently widowed Sadie Adler from a group of O'Driscolls. However, the bad far outweigh the good when it comes to Mr. Dutch Van Der Linde. Dutch's inevitable realization that the Wild West and his way of life was coming to an end is what made him eventually turn on his own gang. The entire story of Red Dead 2 was the Vanderlyn gang attempting to save up enough money to move away from the law and civilization to live unbothered. Gang members were encouraged to donate half of everything they made to the camp. Dutch has never seen donating any of his earnings. And in the prologue of the game, after John gets in a standoff with an aged Dutch and Micah, he finds $60,000 in their cabin. That's $1.6 million in today's money. Dutch had been keeping the money that the camp had been gathering for himself. By doing so, he betrayed the entire Vanderlyn gang. Dutch had soon realized that his crimes against the apparent corrupt government isn't slowing down the modernization of America and that his old way of life is unsustainable. This drove Dutch mad. He became a delusional killer and stopped believing what he once fought for. He killed and robbed without remorse. But at his end, Dutch admits that he knows that everything he's ever fought for or against has been an unwinnable battle. He tells this to John right before leaping off of a cliff to his own death. Dutch may not have been able to stop the modernization of America, but the way Dutch Vanderlyn led his gang of misfits for so long just to end up taking the entire score for himself makes him one of the biggest and the baddest. Welcome to Spooks or Goofs, where I review horror games that brought me to tears, either from fear or laughter. This week we're looking at Until Dawn, a cheesy 80s horror film turned PlayStation exclusive. Until Dawn is an interactive choose-your-own-adventure horror game where every choice and decision can mean life or death. Through what the game calls the butterfly effect, every action you make has a ripple effect that determines how your story plays out. Until Dawn stars eight teenagers on a cold winter night, spending the weekend in an isolated cabin in the woods. Blending elements from 80s slasher flicks and supernatural thrillers, Until Dawn takes you on a harrowing interactive movie where the fate of the actors are in your hands. Your goal is to try and get as many people out alive as you can, a task that is much easier said than done. The game is full of horror movie cliches and tropes, and it's meant to be. The first few hours of the game introduces you to the characters, and at first they seem one-dimensional and stereotypical. But as the game goes on, you start to care about these people, you learn their motives and their relationships with one another. And more importantly, you can shape each of these characters into what you want them to be. Characters I didn't really like during the first hours of the game ended up becoming my favorites based on my actions. Certain traits and relationships with the cast will even change and shift based on your choices. Certain characters may become more brave, while others may become more dishonest. Until Dawn's not your typical horror game, there's jump scares scattered throughout the game, but the fear comes from the moments where your characters are in real danger. The game is stressful at its calmest moments and panic-inducing at its highest. I constantly found myself struggling with the decisions presented to me. Do I hide under the bed, or do I try to grab that weapon? Do I run back to save my friend, or do I save myself? Until Dawn's a special game, and it really took me by surprise how much I enjoyed it. I was hooked almost immediately. The thought of just how many ways that the game could play out had me excited to play through it again. Until Dawn wouldn't make a great horror film, as the interactive experience just simply can't be attributed to anything else. I can recommend Until Dawn to fans of horror games, movies, or TV shows, or even just mysteries. Each chapter plays out like a drama which recaps your choices during a previously on Until Dawn segment, which makes it easy to take in all the events and the dumb choices you previously made. It is possible to have everyone survive in Until Dawn, but I really recommend you play this game blind with no walkthroughs on your first playthrough to get the best experience. It'll let you really feel the weight of your decisions, 
The game will recap who died, how they died, and the time of death during the credits, and you'll see how the survivors reacted to your game. It's the cherry on top of a very bloody but delicious good time. Until Dawn is no goof, and it was one of my favorite experiences on the PS4 so far. Hi guys and welcome to Expectation vs. Reality. This week we are back on the PSVR with Job Simulator. Okay, so my first overall impressions, I mean, if you look around the office, it's, it's, it's pretty clean, it's pretty like a typical office, but I'm pretty sure there's more um, keys on the keyboard than just one and zero. Um, and I also think that you <laughs> probably have to check your emails rather than just delete them all. Um, but it's funny to see all the, you know, little knick-knack things like the figure eight ball or the paper airplane and the fact that you can pick them up and interact with them. And paper airplane? This isn't good. Load oh. up the old spreadsheet Hide it. and fix these numbers. That way he can't see it. Let's throw it way over there though. Who threw this? Stand up. Who did it? <laughs> oh donuts! Come here, I'm gonna eat you! I'm bigger than you, I'm higher in the food chain! Get in my belly! Well, let me just say I hope I never work in an office, unless it's one like this. Um, I can see the similarities, but there's a lot of difference. I think it's an almost like, um, kind of a make fun of mock of, of being an office worker, because a lot of it is just typing on your keyboard, checking emails, and forwarding things back. Um, but it's fun to kind of jump in and see all the uh, funny things, little things you can do. Um, my two tips, don't ever eat a donut off a trash can, and you know, make sure you buy your co-workers the right candy bar. What happens if I eat one of these? <laughs> oh, I just threw up everywhere. No, that's not what I wanted. Get me a candy bar. Oh. Oh, man. Did you just not cool, human? Not like really? Appearance is everything. <laughs> okay, so overall impressions of Gourmet Chef is that my cooking skills are a lot better in real life than they actually are perceived in this uh, simulation right here. I'm a chef. I'm a chef cooper. Well, no, sir. You're not troubling me at all. I can make some tea if you really want it, sir. He's British and we'll make him some tea, sir. How are you doing? Oh, I hate that. Yes, I'm doing well too, sir. Thank you. Coming right up. Let's make him some tea. Let's see if I can catch it. Oh, reflexes. Oh, no. <sighs> Take that one too. Oh. That's going to do it, though, for expectation versus reality here. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Keegan Cooper, and we'll see you next week. Oh, wait. This is this a Magic 8 Ball? Is Gin 2 the best show ever? That's, I mean, heard it here first. Zombies. Groovy. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Cobb Reviews. I'm your host, Charlie Tapino, and today we are talking about Black Ops 2. I have to say, I've been waiting to cover this game because it might be my favorite Call of Duty of all time, and here's why. Although I never played the campaign, I heard a lot of good things about it. It takes place in 2025 while there's a Cold War going on. Unlike any other Call of Duty campaign, Black Ops 2 allows the player's choice, which will affect the rest of the campaign and cause multiple endings. I feel like Treyarch was trying to push the idea that you could replay the campaign and do something you hadn't before. To me, I think this was a great idea, and it definitely worked for their franchise. Not to mention, Black Ops 2 was the most successful and profitable launch of a video game ever at the time, with over 500 million in first day sales. Now onto the multiplayer. I had a blast playing this game. It just felt good. I thought maybe we were getting another recycled game like Modern Warfare 3, but no. This game didn't feel like Black Ops 1 at all, and that's exactly what I wanted. First off, the maps were just fantastic. 
The guns were all very balanced, and the new improvements they made since Black Ops 1 were all really awesome. Improvements such as the pick 10 system while creating a class, score streaks instead of kill streaks, which forced you to play the objective, and league play. League play was a combination of search and destroy, capture the flag, and hard play, probably possibly the most challenging game modes. After five placement matches, you'd be put in a division and play others in your skill range. League play was very competitive, and I'll always appreciate that addition. Lastly, the zombies made some great improvements, adding two new game modes, Transit and Grief. Grief was a 2v2 map where you tried to last longer than your opponents to win, whereas Transit was a bigger map and allowed you and your team to craft items and explore new limits you hadn't seen in previous zombies. Personally, my favorite map was Town, and I just liked the original survival game mode. I liked it because it was very bare bones and straight to the point. Kill zombies, advance another round. I wasn't a huge fan of Transit, although it was pretty fun crafting items and finding easter eggs I had no idea about. Overall, this game was made very good, and they definitely took their time on all of the aspects. I would put this top two, and quite possibly my favorite in the Black Ops series. That's all the time we have today, thank you guys for watching, and make sure to tune in next week. Hello everybody, and welcome back to a new episode of Project Delta, I'm your host Dalton Spies, and with me this week is... Charlie Tapino. I've delayed the inevitable for as long as I could, but here we are, and we're finally playing Fortnite. Of course, Charlie, there's no better time than now, as Chapter 2, Season 2 just dropped a couple of weeks back, and everyone's getting back into the swing of Fortnite. So to start off, Charlie, I want to know, uh, what's your experience with Fortnite, like, from launch to now? Um, so I heard, so when the game came out, uh, I feel like the buzz was a little slow. But uh, one of my friends uh, actually got me into it, and that was like within a few months of it coming out. So I've been playing on and off like since what was it? It's been two years, I'd say. Yeah, uh, I think it's it was so. Uh, so where where do you want us to drop real quick? We might um, as well uh, get that out of the way. Let's go to one of these new spots. Right. That doesn't sound good. I, that sounds like I'm gonna die. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I remember when it first came out. Um, I was pretty excited to try it out because, you know, like at that time, PUBG was in early access, I think, and I was just mad that I didn't have any Battle Royale games to play. Now there's way too many Battle Royale games to play. But at that point in time, I was excited just to try it out and play it, and it felt like it took me forever to finally win a game and get the strategy down. But once we figured out that um, Flush Factory was the best place to go uh, every single time we dropped there, um, and we got our first win, we, we really got it down. and. Um, RIP to Flush Factory, because as we know, it's not in the map anymore. I miss all the OG spots. Because <laughs> sure. it, it always had like the, this perfect balance of loot and like nobody else ever went there. So it was just, it, it, was, it was a great, great spot, you know? And um, we're just about to get our boots on the ground and hopefully not get put in the ground it's too fast because oh, I got a legendary chest. <laughs> okay, well, Charlie's off to a great start. <laughs> I'm in a pool, I think. Looking, looking for something to help me. But um, as time's gone on, I've played the game less and less, you know, like I got John Wick, and I think the last like full season pass um, character I got was Ragnarok. So that was like what, season three or four? Yeah, I think so. So it's been, it's been a hot minute since I've really devoted myself to the game. But um, season two sounds really fun. I like the whole um, like spy aesthetic that they're going with it. So, um, me and my boy, the Tomato Man, are, are back for some more, hopefully. Uh, catch a win, maybe two. Uh, Charlie will probably have to carry me because <laughs> I still have not even picked up a weapon yet. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most beneficial things they've done to their own game is adding the, um, the skill-based ma match ma matchmaking. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Um, because there was a point in time where no one wanted to play because everyone already had had it down and yeah like that that was the same thing for me i'd run into everybody and their mother could uh thank you lord for this being a bot but everybody and their mother like you know had a um 
could build every like an entire tower and a <laughs> fortress like within half a second. I was just there like uh, ramp uh, go, <laughs> and, and I just was, was not quick with building oh, whatsoever. That is not good. I, let me let me pull up my map. I'm sure you definitely need my help right now. Uh, I think I got him. Yeah, I got him. Uh, you, you, could, you could handle him. But um, this is a new thing they added. I can shake him down and it'll locate their teammate, which is oh, right whoa, over whoa. here. That is that is great. So yeah, I think they're doing all they can is to really keep uh, new players coming in, mm -hmm. which is good because you know. The one thing that I've always thought Fortnite has done really well is make sure to keep their game updated. You know, I remember when it was first coming out, there was like a new weapon every couple of weeks and it, some of them stuck and like were good for the game, but some of them, you know, like they were in there for maybe a week or two, like the sword. The sword was in the game for like two days and then they're like, oh uh, yeah, that is overpowered. <laughs> it didn't seem very good There's, there's a guy I'm pinging for you. You better, oh, you better put him. some work in for us. But um. Yeah, so like the constant updates, um, not only like with the content, like the new weapons and uh, my, my favorite of all time, the smoke grenade, which uh, was gone way too soon. <laughs> um, bringing in new cosmetics, you know, every single week. And of course, oh, there's another guy just standing here. Um, gotta hit, hit him with the crouch, hit him with the crouch. Um, just keeping the ball rolling and <laughs> having something new. Yeah, yeah, and they, they're really good at supporting their uh, creators. Like, I mean, as everybody has their own opinion on Ninja, but Ninja's got his own skin in the game now, which is really cool that um, they can, you know, put out a skin or even like just anything that can reference somebody who really helped to make their game huge, like Ninja. Exactly. Fortnite would probably still be big without him, but he definitely played a role in just being that personality that can really push the game forward. I mean, nobody will ever forget him flossing on New Year's Eve in Times Square, <laughs> and everybody just looking at him with that face like, what yeah. are you doing, you know? But he, the, they, the, they help each other out. They help put Ninja on the map, and Ninja really helped them out, which is... I don't, I don't know that I've seen any other game really interact with, uh, you know, the ones who made it as big as it mm -hmm. is. Which, um, it's, that's great. I mean, Epic Games is now, you know, trying to create an empire just off of Fortnite, which is kind of working. They've got their own uh, Epic Games store. It's basically their own version of Steam or Uplay or whatever, where they will pay publishers to put their game on their site, hmm. which is okay i mean i don't play on pc i'm sure uh, i'm sure cade could tell you all about that he, he'll say that epic games uh store is the biggest and the baddest store <laughs> <laughs> hopefully some week he'll talk about that but um are, do you have any like favorite weapons in this game um the shotguns just the shotguns yeah back when a uh, double pump used to be a thing mm -hmm. uh they got rid of that and then people went straight to pump tack so mm. it didn't really fix it too much, but now there's like a uh, like a time you have to wait to switch switch and shoot in between. Yeah, uh, double pump used to be literally everybody's nightmare. <laughs> it was um, especially because that was even before you know people knew how to build. Yeah. So it was everybody just going face to face with each other and whoever gun, whoever around. got the uh, the good old headshot tick um, actually won the game. It reminded me a lot of Halo and how <clears throat> when you got in a fight. Everyone was just kind of jumping back and forth, mm -hmm. trying to get shots on each other, not even building, which is probably the biggest part of the game. Speaking of Halo and something that is in Halo, but they took out in, in Fortnite, sadly, team killing. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> oh, I got a team. Oh, no. Ping him. I'll sneak up on him. Maybe. But I remember, like, I used to play it with uh, my brother a lot, and... <laughs> I would, uh, we'd, we'd pretty much half the games we play, we'd end up team killing each other, uh, whether it was by accident or on purpose. So it was uh, a good time to have a bad time. Yeah, um, I don't even know how long they kept that in, but it definitely didn't last, and I imagine some people got banned. <laughs> yeah, are there, um, are there any things that used to be in the game that have been removed uh, that you really wish they'd bring back? So as of recently, they brought it back um, with the upgrades and stuff and being able to side grade your weapons. Uh, I really like the heavy AR mm. and they vaulted it for a really long time, but I believe with the new chapter two, they brought it back and 
you can't find it out of chess, but you can uh, side grade your assault rifle. And I'm sure something everybody wants back in this game are the mechs. I never even played <laughs> when they had the mechs, but all I had to do was go on Twitter to see everybody and their mother just whining and moaning about how overpowered they were. So it was, I think that they definitely caused the entire Fortnite world some distress. Yeah, um, and I'm surprised how long they kept it in. Usually when, you know, they yeah. make that big of a mistake, they'll take it out, make or at least make a counter for it so there was at least something to do, but that was a really stupid decision. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this game isn't over just quite yet, but uh, this episode of Project Delta is. So uh, me and Charlie are going to finish this game, but we'd like to thank all of you for tuning in this week, and we'll see you next week on Gen 2.